Great. And then I leave the stage to Stefano and Vittorio. Thank you. So uh, I guess I don't know see if uh, uh, Vittorio would like to say something before we start with the exercise. No, Stefano, I follow your your talk like a student. So please. Uh, okay. Well, a student that knows better than the, the one that presents. So, but whatever. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, in this during this uh, hour and a half, let's say. Uh, we are going to see uh, the exercises that were uh, requested in the Plum website. I have it here just for, uh, for reference. Uh, the system, uh, well, you had time to uh, get used to uh, what we had to simulate. It's the benzamine trypsin system. This is the, the protein is the trypsin and this small molecule is the benzamidine. And we know uh, the crystallographic binding pose, which was represented here in, uh, in this image. And the in main interaction between benzamidine and, uh, uh, well, I'm not sharing my screen. Good start. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So the main interaction between benzamidine and trypsin is with an aspartate that is uh, on this coil here and uh, you could see it in uh, in vmd but without any further ado let me load the structure that was uh, given to you which is this one start to grow so this was the system already prepared uh, you had also a tpr ready for uh, for uh, running let me just uh, adjust this uh, as to better understand uh, what we are doing with, what we are de dealing with. Ah, let me so show you everything that I'm doing. So as in the image, we have this system here, the interaction happens with an aspartate, which is, Aspartate 171, you can see here the interaction happening. This here is the pocket for the, for the binding. So the benzamidine, what it does, it enters here and then exit this way. The first exercise was to create a funnel input uh, file, funnel dynamics input file, um, creating, let's say, a path exit for benzamidine and a good enough uh, funnel for the, for the interaction to happen. And this is exactly what we are going to do together. So for this exercise, I requested for you to use the uh, interface that we created. Now I have already the file prepared. Okay. So uh, you had to load the tooltip uh, uh, library because I don't know if you saw it, but uh, this was the interface. Is if you over on uh, one thing of the interface, uh, a description of what it is appears. Okay, this is the tooltip function. So you also had uh, how to what to uh, put in the in the boxes. With, uh, within the interface. So uh, as I explained in, in, uh, in the Plum website, uh, the first thing to do is to define a direction for, uh, for the funnel and to define a direction for the exit route of benzamidine. In this case, it is the exit route because we already know the binding pocket, but you might have a system that for example is in the unbound and you want to lead it inside the binding pocket. So in that case is the uh, binding route. But in this case, we are defining the unbinding route. Option to define the direction of the funnel, as you can see now, it is initialized in a, a awkward position. Uh, option would be to change the X, Y, and Z value in the interface for two points, point A and point B. Uh, which I can explain better in uh, this presentation here. So the funnel is composed, uh, if I zoom this. Okay, 
So let's say that here you have in gray your protein. The final is defined by two points, A and B, and the two points define a line, which is the main axis of, of the funnel. Depending on these two points, the position of these two points, you have the direction of the funnel. Then you can define the three other parameters, which were these three, ZCC, alpha, and the radius of the cylinder, which has exactly those. So let's see in, uh, in practice. So one, the first thing that you could do, uh, knowing the interaction that was, was, was formed here, was to place point A and point B on one atom of the protein and one atom of the benzamidine. This was the fastest way, let's say, to place the, the funnel. So this is what I'm doing right now. So you had to press here. In the first option, press key P and pick an atom from the screen to move point A. So I go to the visualization window, I press P. You see that my cursor became a cross. And then I click on one atom of the protein. You see now the yellow point, which is point A, has been placed. Then you have to click here to move point B, clicking, for example, one atom of the benzamidine. And here we have a possible direction for the funnel. Then these can be changed. For example, here I'm going very close to this random coil. So maybe I would like to move more downwards towards the Y axis. So for example, point B, I can increase this to, for example, instead of 59, 65, I press enter. And as you can see, the new direction has been changed. So this was to change the direction. I'm not going to uh, work too much to uh, make perfect the direction of exit. Just remember that uh, in order for to calculate an accurate estimation of the binding free energy, you need, of course, to sample everything in the bound region, which is here, but you also need a good reference point for the unbound region, which is here. And in the unbound region, I must be sure not to feel any interaction with the protein. So uh, depending on the cutoff that you employ in uh, Gromax Amber or whatever uh, molecular engine that you want to use, you must be sure to have a, a volume here in the cylinder that doesn't feel interaction, electrostatic and van der Waals both with the protein. Okay, so the correct position of the funnel would be something with the escape route being far away from the protein and containing the entire binding pocket in the conical region. Right now, it doesn't, but because we didn't change this parameter here, ZCC, alpha, and the radius of the cylinder. For example, already changing ZCC to 20, these values are with respect to uh, point A. If you go to invisible mode, you can see point A in yellow and point B in green. So 20 would be, Starting from the yellow, I count 20 angstrom, and that is the switching point, which is this one you can see here. So moving ZCC, you just move this line. So putting on 20, you would have immediately that you see that the funnel is, uh, the conical part is starting outside of the, of the protein, which is better. But with the alpha, this is in radians, uh, with an alpha of one, it's way too large. Now, with the funnel metadynamics, you have always to consider the ligand as one point. So consider just one point that is moving in this volume, in this orange volume. You can immediately see that this point can go outside of the binding pocket. And these would be all states that are not interesting in the uh, binding. Uh, and so uh, I would not need to, I would just lose time uh, to converge if I would allow uh, this to be sampled. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ramin Merani, uh, do you have a question? I see your hand raised. Yes, uh, regarding to, to the point that you mentioned that no uh, unbounded uh, side should fill the protein. So yes. by this means uh, the uh, ZCC location, I mean, the, the exactly the point. Uh, so the minimum will be the transition from the cone to the cylinder, okay? That point should not fill the protein or, or uh, you mean, 
a volume of the cylinder. So uh, you can put ZCC wherever you want. That depends, for example, on the opening of the pocket. Now, uh, in this case, uh, the opening of the pocket is really well defined. Uh, let me just go to invisible mode because this, so the, but the, uh, the pocket you can see already is this one. So this is the opening of the pocket. So you would like for your uh, conic, no, sorry, the, yes, the conical part of the funnel to entirely cover this part, mm -hmm. but not go too much farther away. Okay. So you okay. want to cover all this part. Generally, what I suggest is also to cover all the uh, neighboring uh, amino acids, because in some proteins, they like uh, promote the binding by leading uh, the ligand uh, inside the binding pocket. But in this case, you, you define ZCC wherever you want, and then you need a volume in the cylinder to not fill the protein. Can be here, can be here, ind independently from ZCC. Okay. Okay, if I may add, uh, if we put in the daily practice, suppose that we have a molecular target with an unknown ligand binding mode, we just know, which is pretty, common, you know where is the binding site, but you want to investigate the, 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 uh, with a certain degree of, of certainty the, the binding of your ligand, the suggestion is to have a cross-section, as Stefano said, that includes the binding site, and regarding a switching point the ZCC, it's up to you. If you are not interested in identify all the transition intermediate states of the link along the banding pathway, you can use a ZCC which is close to the banding site, being sure that the amplitude of the cone allows you to include, well include within the cone sections, the banding site exploration. In other words, the ligand should explore the binding site without touching the edge of the cone section. Then it reaches the ZCC, it goes directly into the unbound states. Okay. This makes the simulation faster in terms of convergence. You are doing your job in finding the binding modes and have multiple recrossing events. Okay. Then, if you're interested in, 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 in defining not only the ligand binding mode, but also binding modes, alternative binding modes, the transition states, because you want to perform some kinetic calculations, you can also um, finalize uh, you perform a second serial simulation or your preliminary final simulation in order to identify if there are important energetic states that were not considering due to the shape of your funnel in a second series of simulations. But generally, generally, the rate determining step, the kinetically rate determining step, in other words, the high energy that define the kinetics of binding and binding is the barrier that separates two binding modes that are within the binding cell cavity. So in the most cases, so if you, if you set a ZCC value that is right at the door of your protein structures, you are, you are in, the, in most of the cases, you already observe the exploration of the ligand binding modes and the most important binding modes of the ligand in the binding set. I don't know if I was clear. Yes, yes, you were clear. But my question was about the unbounded uh, part. So only having only having one uh, location, I mean, one volume, I mean, a certain volume that is that is far enough from the protein is sufficient, which which will be defined by the upper wall. Uh, uh, right. Component the rest it. is a waste of time. Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, you, uh, when you will you, when you become familiar with fundamental dynamics, you will observe that when you compute the free energy profile or the PMF as a function of as a reaction coordinate of the distance of your drug with respect to the protein by side, you will see that this becomes flat in the bound state and it becomes flat already close to the cutoff of the bounded condition, which means 10 to 12 angstrong between a pair of atoms, one coming from the drug and one coming from the protein. It's going because the contribution of the Leonard Jones and the Coulomb, not contribution for electrostatics respectively, is switching, is going to zero. So once the ligands, the drug does not feel anymore the protein, it's very close to uh, the cutoff value that you set for the uh, short range interactions. So you can place your upper wall slightly too angstrom longer, more distant. You know what I mean? Yes, yes. But you, uh, I would say uh, the proof that your choice was good 
comes from the fact that you will see a flat unbound for 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 an, for two or three angstrom a flat free energy value in the unbound state. Yeah. Okay. Yes. 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 Thank you. My pleasure. Please, Stefan. Okay, so in the meantime, I just changed a little bit the parameters. So as you can see, I reduced the alpha to 0 0.45. And uh, already you can see that the uh, funnel is including most of the binding site. I'm leaving a, a little bit this part. You can see that it is cutting here, the, the funnel. Uh, I could, for example, adjust a little bit point A. So if I move point A towards this direction, so with the plus zeta, uh, let's say 45, maybe I'm solving the issue here. You can see that now the entire binding site, you can see is uh, inside the, I don't know if you can see it, but I see the entire binding site like uh, uh, under, the orange uh, surface. So you can see that in this case, uh, uh, everything will be, will be covered. So let's say that this is good enough for uh, uh, the ZCC and alpha parameter. The radius of the cylinder just controls how uh, large is the cylindrical section. Uh, this will only, um, if you reduce it, uh, of course you will converge faster. Because, for example, if I put here 0 0.5, you see that this is uh, slimmer. But we uh, noticed after some benchmark that uh, 1.0 is uh, uh, a good enough agreement uh, between co convergence time and uh, precision in, uh, in the calculation. We, because with 0 0.5, you would have like your ligand uh, uh, bouncing from one uh, wall to the other like bouncing here in the cylinder. With one instead, so a, di a diameter of two angstrom in total, it is enough for the ligand to not uh, start doing ping pong between the, uh, the surface of the, of the cylinder. So you, can, you could leave a radius of the cylinder to one, you could increase it, what, whatever you want, just know that if you increase it, uh, you lose uh, time uh, because the, all of this space has to be sampled instead of the uh, previous smaller space. So uh, once we define the main uh, parameters of the, of the fundamental dynamics, there are these four values that must be defined, which is lower wall, upper wall, minimum of fps.lp and maximum of fps.lp. I still have this presentation to better explain to you what uh, I meant something like for example here okay perfect so let's say that this is the funnel that we created okay based on this funnel the uh, code of fundamental dynamics will create a bias file which is this rectangle here and these points here are the points inside the uh, what will be written the bias file and all the points that are in, inside the shape of the funnel will have a potential of zero. Whereas all the points that are outside will have a potential greater than zero. So if the ligand tries to consider always the ligand as a point, if the ligands try to go out of the funnel, it will be pushed back. A representation of the bias file. This is, for example, the bias file that I created for uh, the paper of the natural protocol. So you can see that I have zero everywhere here. And then the, uh, the bias start uh, increasing when I leave the, the funnel. An important thing as uh, Professor uh, as Vittorio said is that uh, all the bound states, so when the ligand is entering in the binding pocket and we can see it here, should not touch by any means the surface of the conical region, okay? So you must contain all of them inside the bulk of the, uh, of the conical region. You cannot, for example, put, let's say uh, 16, let me see, no, even, even lower, 12. Something like this would not be enough because the ligand you can see can enter and then can bounce on the, on the walls, okay? So 
it has to be fully contained. So uh, this value here, mean FPS and max FPS uh, LP, are just the minimum value for line pos. Uh, its new name is FPS.LP. LP stands for line pos. And the maximum value for FPS.LP, which are this value here and this value here in order to generate this rectangle. This dimension, which is line dist, will be automatically computed by the alpha that you provided. So uh, the system just takes, okay, how much is the, uh, the value for the line pulse, and then computes the amplitude with the alpha that you provided. So you do not have to provide this uh, parameter here. In, this in our case, you can help to decide which are the limiting factor for uh, the bias file by going to invisible mode and using these red spheres that in theory are the uh, lower wall and upper wall, but will help you to define a value for, for these two. As I said, everything is in function of point A. So point A would be zero. If I put zero here and zero here, you will see that the red point goes exactly over the yellow point. Uh, maybe uh, it was not zoomed. So we, are, we were here. If I click on zero, I go exactly over the uh, yellow point. So let's say that this is enough for us. So if you consider the benzamidine as one point, you can see that if that point tries to reach here, it will be against this coil here. So it will go against the bulk of the protein and will not be able to reach this point. So this point is good enough as a minimum value. It will never be reached. And then as I explained you before, I need somewhere here in order to not fill the protein, to have enough distance between my ligand and the protein in the unbound. So let's see if, for example, 30 is enough. So 30 would be here, over there. I guess it's enough space to allow. So let's put 30 here. And the lower wall and upper wall are just safety, uh, safety nets in order to not reach, in order, if something happens, you will you must never reach these values. So in this case, I would put one or, or two angstrom uh, before uh, this zero value. So in this case, it would be here and 28 here. The problem of having the ligand going outside of the grid is that for each step of dynamics, the position of the ligand is checked inside the bias. So what happens if I go outside here, there will be no point to compare my position with bias and the simulation will crash. And this is one of the, let's say, uh, errors that you might obtain with the fundamental dynamics uh, out of grid, the out of grid error. So uh, once you define this 0, 30, and 2, and 28, you can go on with the generation of the of the input. I tried uh, to explain uh, in a very fast way what the anchor point is. We, you see here a third option with the definition of the anchor point. So the main reason to define an anchor point is that uh, when you uh, when plume calculates for periodic boundary conditions. It jumps from one atom to the next of the, if let's say that the protein is defined before the ligand. So it will take the first atom defined of the protein, then jump to the second, third, and so on and so forth, and will search for the closest periodic image of the next atom with respect to the previous one. So uh, I have, I should have uh, a video here, maybe. Okay, I'm not sure if, so let's say that I have point one, two, and three, it will jump like this, and it will go over all the protein until I reach the ligand. Now, what is the problem is that if you define, for example, a, a protein that has the end here, and my ligand is in the unbound state, and its periodic image is here, 
the closest image will be this one instead of this one. So what happens is that Plum says, okay, my ligand is here. It is outside of the grid because the grid would be here. And I obtain the, the error. So what I uh, uh, implemented was the anchor point. So from the end, I jump to the anchor point and generally uh, on one body with, with one protein, you will always uh, jump to the correct atom unless of course you have uh, a quaternary structure. So different monomers in different positions. If they are, for example, head to tail, that would be, uh, sorry, head to head, that would be a problem. But in the case of one protein with just a tertiary structure, in general, you can jump from the end to the anchor without problem. And from the anchor, I can jump to the ligand. Okay, so if you define a good enough anchor, you most likely will never have problem with the periodic boundary conditions, but there are other um, things that you can do to uh, avoid this, uh, this issue. So uh, to decide a good anchor point, and here I'm clicking on the third option here, uh, you can define, for example, an atom in the unbound state. So let's say that my ligand is at the red point. I have to define an atom of the protein, which is the closest to the ligand when it is in the unbound state defined by the path that I, I uh, declared with point A and B. So now I will click on P and define an atom here. Hopefully I clicked something. And we will see then on the canvas if uh, I was able to click an atom. Yes, Ramin, uh, go on. Uh, one question about the a slide that you showed. So when imagine that when the endpoint uh, see the periodic image, okay. So yes. in a in a error case, so you see that when we define the anchor point and in that location, you said that it jumps. So does it ignore the endpoint, or uh, what uh, do you mean by this jump? You know, do, do we calculate that wrong force or not? No, uh, for the amount for the calculation of the forces, uh, it is left aside. Uh, it is just uh, inserted in the code for uh, defining the atoms for the periodic boundary conditions. So if you're asking if, uh, because uh, as you correctly say, the, in uh, the collective variable, all the atoms that are defined will experience forces calculated mm -hmm. with respect to the uh, derivatives. Uh, the derivatives will end at the end point of your protein. The mm -hmm. anchor serves just to jump correctly. So it is, uh, uh, it is a string of values, okay? When it has to calculate which is close to, uh, which atom is close to which atom, inserted in that string, there's uh, the string in that array, sorry, inserted in that array, there's also the anchor point. Whereas for the calculation of the derivatives, uh, there is uh, no anchor point. Or to better say, the value of the derivatives are automatically put to zero. So it will be uh, as if uh, there's nothing there. So there will be a, I mean, no force calculate in, in that, I mean, uh, in that sense, uh, is it correct? Yes. So you're saying when we see, when we see this endpoint is outside from that point, uh, so on, we don't, we don't calculate the forces for the rest of residues. Not for this atom, but then you will calculate forces for the ligand. Oh, okay. Okay, so it's just, uh, uh, a milestone, a middle step, in order for me to get the uh, mm -hmm. the correct ligand, uh, mm -hmm. and it, just that, because then derivatives for these uh, are automatically are coded to zero. So, uh, 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 so, to be more precise, I should say that you must never define uh, an anchor point, which is one of the points that you use for the uh, alignment because that would be R coded to zero. And so you are canceling the uh, derivatives that you are calculating and putting zero to that atom. Mm -hmm. but, but generally, one question, yes. One, one question is that, isn't it better to ignore the anchor point and uh, run a simulation and uh, define the simulation box large enough that we don't see this error, uh, you know, uh, to, be, to be on a safe side, you know? That is the last, uh, um, uh, the last thing that I would do. Mm -hmm. Not because it's wrong, that is completely correct. So uh, enlarging your box in order to uh, 
avoid any of these problems, okay? Uh, and in general, you can always do that because the radius, well, well the distance that you define, this one, from line post zero to 30, you just have to define a box that is uh, uh, greater than 30. So if you define a box that yes. uh, has the uh, radius of 30.5, you're automatically outside of the problem. Pro However, what you can, you might find out, for example, for deep binding pockets and so on and so forth, would be an uh, enormous box with a lot of waters. And in general, what we do uh, regarding also the question of one uh, of the uh, other participants about the um, explicit, explicit or implicit solvent, we always prefer to go uh, with the uh, explicit, ex explicit solvent because we can, we can see with fundamental dynamics also uh, metastable states that have like waters uh, uh, bridging the interaction which is the case for, for example, for this system. So we have a minimum, uh, which is this one. And then the next minimum would be the benzamidine slightly uh, uh, distancing a little bit from the aspartate and a water molecule bridging the interaction. You wouldn't be able to see that with uh, uh, implicit solvent. And with a, a, a enormous radius, uh, you would find that your performance scale very badly. Uh, so um, I, you know, I prefer to insert the anchor point. Yes, uh, I absolutely, you're absolutely right. But uh, doesn't uh, does this anchor point add another? So imagine this will solve that any uh, any uh, box that I give to the simulation, this help of anchor point uh, will ignore the uh, periodic boundary condition. So I can go to a very even a small uh, box, you know, uh, and I don't give the uh, error of the, you know. I don't see the periodic condition is satisfied or not. That's that's the uh, downside of you know having this anchor point on my mind. Some pocket may be very close, you know, depending on the location of the anchor point. Yes, potentially yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, once everything is has been set. Uh, you have just to uh, make sure that here in ID, there's, there is the same value that you have in the VMD main. Now, uh, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I, it's a bit laggy, my VMD main. But uh, now, now, now it's fixed. Uh, you can see that the ID for my system start.grow is zero. So uh, I put here zero. In, in, in theory, there should be already zero. The ligand would be for example, uh, rest name mol and no h. These take a string uh, uh, selection of plumed. So this is like uh, um, a phrase of plumed. It means that I, sorry, I require a, resi a residue which name is mol and without considering the hydrogens. So and no h. So I click enter on this. Uh, I know that for some of you, uh, there was a problem also with uh, uh, binding of the keys. So enter was not working. Uh, we know that, for example, between Ubuntu or uh, um, Mac, the Mac uh, operating system, uh, there might be uh, differences. For example, in some, some ways, in some cases, uh, the middle uh, pointer in the mouse uh, is considered the uh, right click, uh, but that is inside TCL. Uh, we cannot do anything about it, uh, unfortunately. When you are done, you click on apply, and in theory, you should have the entire uh, plume the input already already printed. As you can see, I was able to uh, select an anchor point. If you cannot select an anchor point with this visualization, you just have to go to lines or liquorice for the protein and click an atom in, uh, in that way. Or if you know uh, an atom that uh, would do the trick for your system, you can just change it manually here, okay? So for example, if uh, uh, that is uh, an option that we, we added. For example, if you go to, to the canvas, I can, for example, cancel these three. And this will be translated to the uh, 
to the plume the input that you that you will generate. Uh, you can see here that uh, there are some uh, options that you can uh, erase or comment. For example, the restart could be commented by adding uh, an hashtag. And you have also these fill that are compulsory as input and these question marks that are necessary files. And one of the necessary files that you had to create was the reference. Uh, file, which was a PDB of the system. Now, uh, the PDB of the system can be generated. Uh, I don't know if you can see it here in file. You already have, if you select the, uh, can I, no? Okay, sorry, sorry, okay. Uh, if I select the uh, the file that you open, that you use to, to um, implement the, the fund, and then you do save. You do save coordinates. It will ask save data from. This is our structure as a PDB, and you would do save. Then you could you can save the PDB file here. Now this PDB file will contain all the atoms that are inside, and as we saw at the beginning here, there's also water molecules. One thing that I forgot to write in the uh, web uh, web page of Plumed was that this file that is given to funnel underscore ps is only used for the alignment. So I should have... Uh, well, I can show you this one. I don't know if you can see it. So here you see what happens to, to the system. You can see that the protein is going, uh, is uh, rotating and translating however it pleases in the simulation box, but we need to have this visualization here. So as if the protein is fixed and uh, the ligand is going uh, in and out following the space of the, of the funnel. The only way uh, to do that would be to uh, compute uh, uh, rototranslational matrix and in order to have a rototranslational matrix, we need a reference structure. The reference structure is the structure that we used to set up the funnel. So in each step, we just align this reference with wherever I am in the simulation. We compute the position of the ligand, and then we repristinate the uh, situation in the, in the simulation. So everything will be automatically transformed. The system can uh, go wherever it pleases, but the, the plumed will always see the uh, the protein fixed in space and on the correct with the correct orientation with respect to the to the funnel. So this file here PDB was defined only to uh, have um, a clear uh, alignment with uh, with the funnel. And in order to do that, uh, generally what we do is we go to the, for example, if I, sorry, let me just take again. So this is the, the file that I would create. Now I'm creating inside, uh, not here, please. So let me go somewhere where I can work uh, without problems. Documents, masterclass, I should have masterclass, masterclass. Uh, I guess here is fine, test.pdb, for example, pdb, pdb. Okay, I save it. And then one thing that we generally do, if I go on uh, uh, my um, terminal, I should have here test.pdb. So this is, this is the file. Some of you also had the problem of um, reading the PDB, or plume the reading the PDB, the problem is this one. Uh, it cannot read alphanumerical value here, I guess, uh, because we are going, uh, there are 105,000 atoms. So uh, well, since we only use this to align the protein, one thing that you could do uh, would be to grab the C alpha atoms from uh, the test.pdb in alignment.pdb. And if I see alignment.pdb, 
you can see that are only the C alpha atoms of the, uh, of the residues. This will not only make faster the alignment algorithm, but will also solve any issue with the numbering because this number here, which is the serial that is read by plumed, must be the same in the simulation. Now we are cutting atoms. You can see that we are jumping from atom five to 24. And if you uh, renumber these, uh, it will be a, a mess because the, then if you put here one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth, it means that this C alpha atom will be aligned with atom one, which was an hydrogen, for example. And uh, you will have uh, a funnel that is completely misplaced. Uh, this is only one thing that you could do. Uh, another thing that you could do even better would be to take only the C alpha atom of the structured regions, which are the one that should fluctuate less. And this will allow you to uh, align even better and even faster, because you would just take uh, an, uh, uh, an interval of, these, of all these values instead of all these C alpha. And the more you reduce these atoms, maintaining, of course, precision with the alignment, the faster will be the code. In general, uh, the fundamental dynamics uh, adds uh, so, um, some problems to performances uh, for this alignment step, because it is repeated for each step of the simulation. But if you provide few atoms here, so let's say 20 atoms or so, or so on, uh, you will just have the performance of a normal metadynamics. It will not be the bottleneck of your simulation, of the performance of the simulation. So uh, in my case, I could, for example, put alignment.pdb here. So um, if I have reference here, I clicked, uh, so I clicked here on, sorry, let me close this one. So I clicked here on reference and it opened me this file here. I am already in uh, documents. And if I search for alignment.pdb, it's not working. Okay. Alignment.pdb. In theory, I have now alignment.pdb here. Okay. So you can change everything inside this plume, the input with uh, the, uh, these uh, options here by putting the correct value in, in this box and clicking on apply. Or you can just export, export for plumed. It will ask save as and uh, something. So for example, here, uh, test master class dot dot. Yes, save. And in theory, I should have here test masterclass dot. And here is my uh, input that uh, that I can use. Uh, I still have to fill all of these uh, of all of these options, but this was the bulk, let's say, of uh, exercise one. So to create a uh, final input that was good enough to run a simulation, must and not to be perfect. And by the way, there are several uh, optimal uh, uh, input, plumed input file that could, could be created. And if you want, you could also add uh, other variables. For example, uh, I like always to uh, represent for this system the distance between these two atoms here, okay? Between the amidine group and the uh, carboxylate of the aspartate. But then you could just uh, modify the input as you, as you wished. Are there any question about uh, generation of the plumed input file? Okay, I guess not. So uh, I did just a small uh, test. I don't know if it is here. Yes, I did a small test uh, with the Conda environment that was given uh, to you by the um, organizers. And I thank them for, for that. Uh, 
and you have here the file of Gromax. In this case, uh, it was used Gromax, but can also be used Amber for, for this calculation. Uh, I called everything test. And uh, whether what I want to stress on the second exercise that was just uh, launching the simulation was the generation of this file here, bias, that is only generated by uh, the code, uh, which uh, in my case was this one. Hopefully, yes. So uh, this here command, well, the, the funnel metadynamics is divided in two main commands, the funnel underscore PS and the funnel line. Funnel underscore PS uh, calculates the relative position of ligand, of the ligand with respect to uh, the funnel. And you have here the X, Y, and Z value for the points of A and B of the funnel. So this is, uh, to calculate the, the, the position of the ligand, whereas this one is done to create this file bias that will be used and read to calculate which is the potential that must be applied, zero or something different from zero. So in my case, let's just see uh, what the bias file, uh, how it is, uh, the bias file is generated. You can see that it, it is a grid of points uh, here you have line pos or fps.lp, and here you have line dist or fps.ld, all the information in the format of plume that you can find on the first line. So I have uh, the two collective variables, the bias that a point would feel in that position, and the derivatives with respect to the collective variables. And this is, goes on and on until I, which is just the representation of this one. So if I would plot this file here, it would give me this graph here. So this is the file that is generated by the uh, funnel metadynamics. And from the metadynamics, now I'm, I'm not, uh, it, just uh, tell me if you want more information about metadynamics, not the funnel part. I, I'm giving for uh, granted the uh, metadynamics part. Uh, but just to uh, tell you that a, a Culver file and an ELS file would be generated as much as uh, well-tempered or uh, standard metadynamics. And from there, you can calculate the, uh, some, the, the free energy surface. I don't know if I have an example here, but we will see the example in the, in the exercise three. So let me go back to the terminal. So for example, in this case, let me go to uh, here. So this uh, is a terminal uh, in the cluster uh, of uh, CSCS that we have in uh, Lugano. And this is uh, a simul the simulation that I did on uh, benzamidine trypsin uh, a few years ago. So uh, to reach 800 nanoseconds, which is the one that are um, published in the natural protocols, you can see that a lot of files were uh, were needed, but in general, you can see that I, I will I will always have uh, the ELS file and the Culver file here. In this case, you see that they are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because I use the multiple worker approach, or in other words, I have, in this case, 10 simulation going in parallel, but everyone is feeling the potential of the other. So uh, when someone puts a potential, they are all synchronized. So everyone will put potential at the same time. And for example, Walker 4 will fill the potential that is uh, placed by Walker 6, okay? So everything will be uh, on the same page. And this will help me to go faster in, uh, in uh, reaching convergence. And will also burn a lot of uh, computational hours. So you have always to be careful in uh, using the multiple workers. Only when the full setup has been uh, declared, then you can use uh, uh, multiple workers. In this assignment, you, you could uh, play a little bit with uh, workers. Let's say you could launch two workers if you wanted, just to see uh, the diversity, the files that are generated. However, one thing that you have to remember, you will always have one ELS file. In this case, uh, I can show you. So in this case, uh, you can see that I have 10 times the time one, 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 10 times, 
10 times 2, 10 times 3, and so on and so forth. If you had two walkers, you would have just two ones, two, two, and, and so on. So the main file that we'll be using that we did this exercise two was uh, necessary for exercise three because we needed these two files, the call var and the its file. And for some of the uh, analysis, we also needed the trajectory, which for Gromax is the XTC file or compressed trajectory. Uh, but in general, exercise two was just uh, simulating. Yes. Uh, just a question here uh, about the XTC file and the Hills file and the Colver. Should be, uh, I mean, in, in later that we wanted to do the reweighting in some case, should, my question is that this XTC file should be at the same frequency of the Hills file or it could be any different frequency? No. Uh, so the Hills, uh, the trajectory is very important to be um, the same frequency of the uh, Hills file. Okay. You can have the Colvar file with a different frequency, even though it is always suggested for all the files to be at the same frequency. This is important, uh, slightly less for Colvar file, but this is important for the trajectory and the ILS file, because if for any reason you have to reweight with a different collective variable and you didn't print that collective variable in the Colvar, you need to launch a driver of your simulation with a new collective variable. And if you, have, if you do not have the same number of points that you have in the yields uh, for the new collective variables, you are unable to reweight the two. Exactly, that, that was the problem that uh, I faced, yes. Thank yes, so I, I didn't <laughs> uh, um, uh, say that in the, in the Plume tutorial, in the um, website, both to not be too uh, heavy, on the, uh, on the information. And also because the, in theory, the TPR that I provided you should have the same stride of the pace of the ILS file. Uh, yes, you know, I was using Amber and uh, okay. I, you know, that file will be huge if I want to decrease the frequency uh, to be in a, you know, imagine if I want to use 500 uh, steps yes. as the hill file. The file will be huge uh, for the XTC file. That's why I escaped and later uh, I had a problem with that. Okay, yes. that, thank you. I just want to make sure that this is the case. You can always uh, uh, the increase the pace of the yields but mm -hmm. you will be you will need to simulate more let's say yes so, yes yes uh, you can also adjust the eight but uh, you, you have to see the best uh, parameters the best uh, set of parameters yourself yes you know one way is that generate the hills with the uh, with the lower pace then uh, then write the code or clean the hills to match with, with the frequency of the uh, you well, know, uh, uh, coordinate. Wait, clean the hills? What do you mean? I mean, by, by, by skipping, make another hills from the hills with the high frequency, uh, with, with the low frequency, then generate to match it with the coordinate file. Does it work? I'm imagine, I, sure imagine, imagine in the coordinate file, I uh, had a 5,000, but I, in the hills, I have a 500, okay? If I okay. skip 10 in the hills file... No, so it will it, not work. Oh, okay. It will okay. not work. The, the ILS file is the most important in this case. So you have always to follow the pace of the ILS file. Yes. So you can, okay. for example, uh, let's say paste 1000, you can XTC, the XTC can be 500, and then you skip frames to reach mm -hmm. 1000, but you cannot do the contrary, like uh, XTC 2000, and you go back to 1000, or you scale the ILS to 2000 to uh, mm -hmm. for the XTC. That doesn't work. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Uh, another question from Palomino. Uh, hi, just a small question. So the bias file, the, it's just a, it's just a grid that says, in the, that says to the ligand, you can be here or you cannot be here, right? Yes. Why was it, is this more practical than developing a mathematical, yeah, just a, a math eval or something like that for the ligands? Uh, would be possible. Uh, the, well, the, the first approach would just, would just, was just to uh, replicate exactly what was the um, protocol of the plumed one, uh, the Fanemet Dynamics one, 
which was already implemented in Plume 1.3, I think. And uh, I just translated everything to the um, to Plume 2. But uh, you could use, for example, uh, Medieval to check uh, to check your position. Yeah, yeah, great. It was just a question like if it was implemented like this because there was a significant advantage or something like that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, no, the, I think that there's no significant advantage with the bias because you would, uh, I think that it is saved in memory. Once it is read one, uh, the first time, it is saved in memory, if I remember correctly. So it would be as fast as checking uh, a point uh, on, a, on an array to the array uh, but uh, um, not sure if which of the two approaches is faster if this or the Mativa but for sure could be done also with the, with the Mativa libraries okay thank you so um, this was just a simulation step you would obtain a uh, um, few files the ILS file. And one of the check that was suggested in order for you to check to see if uh, your simulation was converging or not, was to run this code here, which is the sum ILS. I don't know if you are, uh, if you know what uh, this does, but taking in input, uh, uh, let me just zoom, can I zoom it? No, please. No, okay. Uh, just taking in input the ILS file that you are generating from the funnel metadynamics, you're just checking, uh, constructing the free energy surface, uh, or in other words, you just see the potential that, that you are deposing, you uh, uh, rescale it, and you obtain the free energy surface, and you would check the free energy surface with respect to time. So if this, uh, oh, let me just, there are people that are uh trying to access okay um so if you add the free energy surface uh, uh, that was not changing with respect to time it means that it is uh, generally placing potential all over maintaining the same shape of the free energy surface but just raising the level of the bias that means that uh, you have one check for convergence okay but what these things uh, we are going to see uh, with the other uh, interface directly. So we just close this. We erase this system here. Okay. And we will just call the other interface, which is the start of exercise three. Not sure how many reached this point. Um, I, I uh, provided you in case you couldn't do the simulation. Uh, it was written in the, at the beginning of the um, web page of the masterclass, uh, a folder with uh, uh, a strided trajectory of a simulation that I did on the um, Benzamid in Tripsin system. So you could use that uh, for, the, for the analysis. And this is exactly what we are going to do. So uh, as I said, one of the uh, check that you could uh, do to um, uh, see convergence was this, uh, these sum yields here. And in order to do that uh, with respect to time, in this case of each 0 0.5 nanoseconds, uh, you could directly provide a stride. So add, uh, I think that I also write the code uh, afterwards. No, okay. You can provide a stride for uh, uh, printing the different funnel, uh, the different uh, free energy surfaces. In this case, with the interface, it is automatically done with this command here, run some stride. So what you had to do was to define the binary of plumed. So in this case, it opens me this uh, interface here. So I just go down. I should have the folder apps already prepared. Where are you? Yes, apps, plumed, binary, plumed. You would see when it is uh, connected when uh, plumed will be written here. 
then you can provide, uh, for example, here you need an ILS file, which is the ILS file that you generated in your simulation. Or in my case, uh, it would be the one that I gave you in case you couldn't do the, uh, the assignment. So you add it inside, uh, where was it? Not, not here. You add it inside uh, map. Yes, supplementary data two, and you have yields at 800 nanoseconds. This is uh, a lot of time. Uh, so the yields file is pretty big. So I will do open. And you can see here that it, they, it took yields 800 nanoseconds. Mean to zero, yes. It means just that the minimum of the free energy surface will be set to zero. It helps me to see uh, the scale, how it is increasing, let's say. And I have to define an output folder, which in this case are already prepared for this um, masterclass uh, folder in theory here, lesson. Yes, here, chose. Okay, and the folder has been defined. Now, you just put the stride that you want. In my case, I will put, I will put 1000 or every 1000 lines, a uh, free energy surface will be printed, okay, which in my case should be one free energy surface for each nanosecond. In your case, it was for each 0 0.5 nanoseconds because it was uh, less simulation time. If I remember correctly, it was 250 nanoseconds. But in this case, uh, I will do just 1000. You click on run some mil stride. And in theory, it should think, you can see the rainbow thing here means that uh, it is computing the, the request. Everything, so the code of Bloom will be launched in the TK console. And when all the calculation will be finished, we should see here in the TK console, uh, the result of the summits, um, of the summits algorithm. So we just uh, wait a little. It's uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of lines. And it should create also 800 files. And we can check them with our terminal. So let me see where I'm here. Uh, am I? Yes. So I enter inside the folder where I created, which was lesson, where I created everything. I think that it ended. Yes. So if you're familiar with Plumed, you can see that this is exactly the, uh, what the output of Plumed, the binary of Plumed would give you. You can see that the, all the free energy surface that have been generated, uh, I think that it is uh, uh, small for you to, to see. So I'll just switch to this terminal here. And if I list the content, you can see that 800 free energy surface have been generated, okay? So in the, with this interface, one thing that you could do, uh, let's say that I want to see the endpoint of my simulation, which is the 800. You can click on plot fast. It will open me this interface. Now, if I go to the folder of the lesson, which was in documents masterclass lesson. Okay, I have all the files here. I go to fast 800 dot dot, I open it. It will take some time and then you will see the plot of the free energy surface after 800 nanoseconds. Now, uh, taking uh, one concept that was uh, uh, said by uh, Vittorio at the beginning of this masterclass, you can see that here I have my absolute minimum, here I have a secondary minimum, and so on and so forth, but reaching the unbound region, you can see that the energy is flat, meaning that from this point onwards, I'm not feeling the protein anymore and the system is just experiencing the unbound system. So the ligand solvated by water. And it is correct to always have this flat. It means that it's one of the things that you could check for convergence because in theory, all these states are isoenergetics, uh, isoenergetic, sorry. And then I uh, start to feel the potential because here I have the upper wall. So uh, it goes up again. 
here I have the lower wall, or in this case, it could also be the protein I'm impacting on, the, I'm crushing on the protein, so it cannot go over the protein. And this, for example, is the FES at 800 nanoseconds. However, we are interested to see which is the trend of this free energy surface with time. Uh, this can be done, for example, if we measure the difference between the absolute minimum and our reference value for uh, the unbound. So let's say that here is 0 0.21, here is 0 0.6. So if I provide values from, let's say from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. So if I put here 0 0.3 and 0 0.5, and I will take, for example, three as the, my unbound value. So I put three here. And I click on convergence. The program, what it will do, it will take all the FAST file that have been written in the working directory, which in, in this case was my folder lesson, and we'll calculate this difference, which is the formula that is reported here. We'll calculate this for each free energy surface that you created. So it will calculate this formula at 800 uh, times. And this is the plot that you obtained. So you can see that at the beginning, I have this uh, spike here, but then very fast, it goes to a certain value and stay constant going up and down with respect to that value. So this spike here is because uh, uh, I was lazy and I started all the 10 workers uh, from the same position. So at the beginning of the simulation, all the bias was placed on one state, which was the minimum. So if I provide in the, uh, in the interval of the bound, the minimum, I would have a huge spike in energy here. And then when the workers, uh, let's say, uh, sample all the uh, space that is allowed, the, the free energy will be adjusted to the correct value. The correct value will be represented always in the uh, TK console. And here in this case, uh, uh, it is minus uh, 8.15 uh, kilocalories per mole. This is already uh, rescaled uh, by the presence of the funnel. So all the formula are all applied. You don't have to calculate anything with an error of 1.34 kilocalories per mole. This is given by the fact that you have this spike here at the beginning. But uh, since generally what we do is we discard the first uh, what is generally done is to discard the first part of the um, metadynamics. You can, for example, add a reject time here. Let's say that uh, I start counting my points from 100. So if I put reject time 100 here and I click on convergence again, this plot will not change, but the value here will. And we wait for the, to complete the calculations. Here we have our new estimator is minus 8.1 plus minus 0 0.61. So you can see that uh, it adjusted, not considering this spike that was an artifact because I started all simulation in the same step. Uh, yes, Rami? Uh, my question is uh, about this uh, package that you provided, very nice uh, package. Uh, so could we use this for the uh, normal uh, metadynamic as well? or I looked at that equation, if we put that uh, R, I don't know if this RC also is take care of here or not, but, it, or we can modify it by, by, you know, there is a fraction in that equation. Yes, uh, the, it is exactly what you said. Uh, you cannot use this uh, vanilla as it is uh, for normal metadynamics, because for all these calculations, uh, the rescale for the presence of the funnel is applied, is automatically applied. But if you know a bit of TCL, or if you just want to play mm -hmm. with uh, the, uh, the file inside, you can just remove the 
pi r squared, which is the part that considers exactly. the, um, the, cylind the cylindrical mm -hmm. part of the funnel. And in that case, uh, you yes, you can compute uh, like difference in, uh, in energies here. The only thing that you would have to change also is the fact that uh, uh, generally what is you might be interested in metadynamics would be to um, compare to minima, for example. <laughs> so you might want to like define two intervals instead yes. of an interval and one value. Okay, because here, uh, sorry, I don't have the, the FES anymore, but in the FES I had like the flat mm -hmm. value here. So I was like, in a sense, uh, I could take one value because even taking an interval, it would just be an interval of values that are all the same. Mm -hmm. So on average, I take one value and that one value is enough for all of them. In your case, if you want to confront, for example, two minima, you have to de deploy two intervals. Yeah. Okay. And does it this work for the two-dimensional plot as well? I mean, uh, for the funnel metadynamics. For the funnel metadynamics, it works also for the two-dimensional. Okay. Uh, in this case, uh, just disclaimer for the two-dimensional free energy surface, uh, you have an entire new uh, 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 new collective variable. So uh, the calculation takes way more time than okay. in the 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 one-dimensional because you have an, a new yes. uh, a new axis. Uh, but, but those for, mean y and max y are for that, yes. Uh, yes, exactly. That's that's okay. because the, in this case you do not have an interval, but you have like a square or a rectangle in the in the plot. So uh, this provides you uh, the value of the, the final value, let's say. Uh, so you can see this plot to check for convergence if it is generally uh, staying on average on the same, on a line, uh, you can say, okay, I'm converged. Then you can calculate these are the value of the free energy, the one that you can um, uh, publish, let's say. But we also added uh, another uh, measure which is the block bootstrap analysis. Now, let me just take uh, this for a moment to explain uh, the block bootstrap analysis. So we had this plot here. This is exactly the same. This, oh, come on. This is exactly the same plot that we saw. So what the block, uh, block bootstrap does, uh, let's say that here I have the reject time 100 because I used the reject time 100. It divides the space that I'm considering in 10 blocks. And for each, in this case, they are eight, okay? But uh, in the, in the um, uh, algorithm is divided by 10. And in each of these block, uh, mean and the error will be calculated. Why is this helpful? Because if you click here on block, uh, 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 or after clicking on convergence, you can already click on block bootstrap. And you can see here that he's printing something. So these are average and error for each block. So each uh, uh, part here in the free energy versus time will be divided in the block, calculated average and standard error, and you can compare them. So if, for example, the standard, the, the, the average is always the same or almost always the same, it means that you are converging. And one other thing that it will print is this distribution here, where you can see if in each block, how the, the distribution of values behaves. So if it behaves like a normal distribution, like in this case, it's very good, especially the last ones. So the last blocks, if they behave like this, uh, it's good enough. But if they behave like, for example, if I add, let's see if I add, uh, I remove the reject time, calculate convergence again. Uh, shouldn't have done that. Okay. And then I block bootstrap again. There should be also the first one should be uh, this part here. Not sure how it will come out as a distribution. 
let me see the values. Uh, okay, no, the, this part wins over this part. Uh, and also the distribution can, it's not that bad, but it's a bit on with one shoulder here, but not, not the bad. However, you will see if uh, this, uh, this is a normal distribution. If it is a normal distribution, you can consider your simulation converged. And this is the block bootstrap uh, analysis that we added for, uh, for the calculation. So with uh, three clicks, you already have uh, the value of the free energy, uh, analysis of the convergence and uh, analysis of the, of the bootstrap. Uh, do, do you have a question? Uh, Ramin, or uh, was it from uh, from previous? Oh, sorry, question? it was for previous one. Okay. Sorry. So this uh, was one of the things that I wanted to show you. If you are just interested in uh, the value of one of the free energy surfaces, uh, you can go here on calculate to open this. Let's say I want the uh, the value uh, at eight hundred exactly that value. So uh, what is printed here is an average with uh, with respect to time. So it is average um, weighted on time. In this case, instead, uh, it will be just the absolute value of the free energy 800. So if you click open, the value will be printed on the right of calculate. So even though our average is a minus 8.1, the value at 800 exactly at, the value at that time is minus 8.72. So in case you want that information, you also uh, can have this information here. And um, I, I think that we are out of time. I don't know if you wish to um, continue. We have other uh, two, let's say two uh, implementation that we can see for exercise three, or if you are more uh, interested in the bonus exercise, which was exercise four. Stefano, you can take your time because uh, yes, indeed we have one hour and a half, but we can go even beyond. Okay, we can go over so, time. I think so. Okay. Uh, Giovanni just sent an email that we can close the session because we are we are we are the you no know, the. The speakers so we okay. can proceed uh, and uh, yes uh, so take take the time to to, to finish no, the, the just exercise just, let, let's say that uh, the compulsory stuff has been done if there's someone that has to leave and would like for example to have more information about exercise four that was the bonus exercise or if uh, we can just go uh, all together uh, following the the exercises well, uh, let's let, let's for, let's continue with the exercise. I just want to that, that we can just stop uh, just one two minutes at the end of the fundamental dynamics calculations and uh, analysis of the results before doing the the bonus the kinetic exercise in order to discuss briefly with the other students if there are questions regarding the fundamental dynamics calculations and then we can proceed with the last. Okay. 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 And also, uh, please, uh, there are some messages in the chat. Probably there are people that write it. Don't, don't, they uh, don't know raise the hands. I yeah. don't. I don't see. I don't see. It. So probably it's good to ask the people to raise their hands because it's better for us to. Because unfortunately, we we could read uh, the chat. So Anya, for instance, wrote a couple of messages. So please, Anya, raise your hand. It's better to visualize your hands raised, and we can give you the the, the, the microphone to make to ask question. Hi, I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, I, 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 it's a question for a, a step before in, the, in the before running the simulation. It was okay. I, I was just not completely sure how to fill the empty part uh, for a generic simulation because it looks like more advanced to choose all the the, param the parameters. Okay. So if uh, everyone is okay with that, we can go back uh, uh, very fast on the uh, input. 
that's called very fast on the, I, the I have the one question about I mean here but I can ask it later but if you can come back here that would be fine. well since we are here uh, yes that just would... make, and, and then we will go back to the plume the input yes 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 that would be great so uh, somewhere in the tutorial that you uploaded say that uh, in the we are using the uh, so we don't need the reweighting for calculating based on the distance Imagine if you wanted to, uh, I mean, in the paper that you published, you, there is a two-dimensional two uh, free energy surface that you uh, plotted the free energy as a function of uh, LP and LD, I believe. Uh, uh, I do both in function yes. of distance and torsion and in function of uh, uh, also line pos, which is FPS.LP and torsion but yeah. also uh, line pos with line dist. Exactly. So imagine if you wanted to go uh, as a function of LP, okay? So we, we need a reweighting. Uh, no, if you go on, fun on function of uh, FPS.LP, you do mm -hmm. not have problems. So you do not why, why is, because we are, we are biasing the simulation with uh, metadynamics applied on the distance, isn't? Uh, so the plume data file that you provided, metadynamics applied on the D1. Which is the distance? What I did? No, I mean or, in the plume what? that no, no, in the plume that is here, the plume data file that we generated here, and and you gave was the metadynamic was applied on the distance d one. Uh, in the file that I gave you, you had to uh, provide the arguments for the metadynamics, and I told you that you could choose, for example, the distance or the uh, or the uh, line pos. The other the one that I provided you as a, a check, let's say, which mm -hmm. is the one that I used uh, mm -hmm. for the natural protocols. Yes, it has a distance inside. And in, in that case, for example, I had to reweight really? in function of line pos. And, that to, and then I provided all the facts that I calculated in function of line pos to the interface. Okay. Because so the, the integration, sorry, the integration of the, the Z in the formula, which is this one here, this DZ here is line pos. Yes, exactly. So uh, for uh, re, uh, so for uh, metadynamic also accept the FS, uh, FS dot LP as a, as a variable, as an argument for the yes. metadynamic? Okay, yes. maybe I did something wrong. However, you need to be careful uh, mm -hmm. when defining, when choosing uh, line pos because uh, by construction line pos flatten everything to <laughs> yes, a one projection. line. Yes, it's a projection. Instead of a distance that maybe takes into consideration like the uh, interaction with uh, the partner that you want to mm -hmm. uh, to study. Okay, yes. if you have like an insight, I know that it has to like I have mutagenesis uh, experiments. I know that if I mutate these, uh, uh, the, I have no more interaction. Uh, you might want like a collective variable that takes uh, explicitly that into consideration. Okay, so, you know, here, here in this, uh, exactly in this page, somewhere you mentioned that because we are doing uh, metadynamics and uh, nowhere we mentioned that the collective variable that we are using is the, uh, you know, uh, is the FSLP or its distance. Yes, the, you could use whatever you want. Yes. Maybe, yes, it was not uh, uh, very uh, understandable, uh, especially uh, for uh, uh, beginners of Plund, but it was my error. Okay, no, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So, uh, the, the, yes, the, the input. So let's say line by line, I guess. Uh, I can open, do I have it? Uh, no, maybe in the previous folder. Uh, yes. Okay. So let's zoom a little bit. Okay. So this is very similar, considering from this point onwards, this is very similar to what you had. As you can see, I commented the restart option here because this was the starting point of my uh, of my simulation. Uh, so the restart was uh, was not needed, and on a later stage, uh, we also adopted the grid, the use of grid instead method. But we will reach the point. So in this case, I defined a collective variable here. The label this. Uh, 
representation here, uh, how it is written, it is label defines uh, this collective variable. So everywhere in the input, uh, if I call D1, the program will know that uh, it's this distance here. And it's, it's only calling a collective variable distance, uh, which involves two atoms, which is uh, one atom of the protein and one atom of the ligand. And you can see which atom they are from the file start.grow that I provided you. So this is very simple. In this case, uh, I create with the label lig a center of mass, where this is a com is center of mass, involving atoms, and these are the heavy atoms of the ligand. So if I, uh, I don't have the simulation, but I should have like, okay, if I take all the carbons here of the benzene ring and the two uh, nitrogen and the carbon of the amidine, I put all of them together, I calculate the center of mass. This is exactly what this line does but you didn't have this on, uh, on your input. So I'm just going uh, explaining what I'm doing here. So this was the first line that you had. Uh, it is uh, label FPS and funnel underscore PS create two automatically create two variables, which is LP and LD. Now let's say that I want to change this uh, uh, with uh, test the output of funnel underscore PS will be test.lp and test.ld. Now you see why uh, it is called fps.lp and fps.ld. So everything you put here in the label will, be, will receive an added uh, .lp or .ld depending on uh, how you call this label and you, call, you can call this label however you want. But just remember that if you change this label here, you have also to change the arguments here. So the name must coincide. Now, funnel underscore PS, this was the first uh, entry that you had to complete, which was the ligand. Uh, I think that you, you also had this line. You, you must have this line because otherwise you cannot provide this one, uh, which is the center of mass of the ligand. As I told you at the beginning, uh, uh, of the uh, exercise one, uh, the, the ligand is always considered one point because in the code we provide the center of mass. So this center of mass is provided here and that's why the funnel will consider the, uh, the ligand as, the, as one point. Then we have reference, uh, which as explained is the PDB used to align the protein the anchor that has been explained to avoid any uh, periodic boundary condition problems. And these points here are the value of X, Y, and Z of points A and B in the funnel. Well, however, these you already have set because that it's uh, taken into consideration by the interface. Now here I have another line that uh, is not compulsory. Uh, and you didn't have on uh, on your input, so uh, I would skip. If you're interested, we can then uh, comment on that. Then you have the funnel, uh, which is the other line for funnel metadynamics. Arguments, as I told you, must be, since you are comparing position of the ligand with respect to the file bias, you need to provide the coordinates, exact coordinates of the ligand with respect to the funnel. So in this case, the arguments of funnel will be the arguments coming out from this line of code here, which is the position of the ligand. So here you have fps.lp or fps.ld or whatever name.lp and whatever name.ld. These are the value that you set on the interface and they uh, should um, be transformed to the, to the correct value, so 1.8. In this case, I used 0 0.55 and so on and so forth. This min s is min fps.lp, but I didn't want to put like a, a too long uh, value here. So this min s is exactly min fps.lp, which was the minimum value for line pos. And same here, maximum value of line pos. Uh, but also these have been set automatically. 
This is one of the uh, other parameters that you have to uh, provide yourself. Uh, this is a value of the constant of, in practice, is this one. So if we have this graph here, the value that is provided here, which is in, the, in this case is uh, 35,100, is exactly the st strength of the potential when I go outside from, the, from my funnel of one nanometer. So this is in uh, ki uh, kilojoule per mole per nanometer squared. And it provides the, the energy, let's say the, the strength of the, of the bias, just that. How to write this value? Well, in general, uh, this was uh, this value here, which seems very strange and uh, out of nowhere, is the transformation of the uh, constant that was used for previous uh, metadynamics calculation with uh, the uh, benzamidine trypsin system. However, the previous value was in uh, uh, kilocal per angst, uh, kilocal per mole per angstrom, and this is the transformation in kilojoule per nanometer squared. Okay, so it's just this. And we found out that this was a good enough value for a ligand of 18 atoms. In general, you would like to increase a little bit this one if you have uh, small ligands, uh, small, relatively small ligands uh, with more than 18 atoms. But in general, you are on this uh, order of magnitude. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Um, so, but. This one, if we have a different kind of ligand, yes. how do we calculate roughly this, this number? If we have a bigger ligand or a different type of ligand? Well, there's, uh, I don't have a formula to calculate uh, what you should place there in, uh, in, the, in the kappa uh, parameter. The only thing that you would see is that if it is not strong enough, your, uh, your ligand might uh, arrive at a certain point uh, outside of the funnel, okay? Until uh, there's enough energy to push it back, depending on the in inertia of your, uh, of your ligand. Of course, if it has a greater mass, uh, it will provide a greater strength when it is pushing on the bias of the funnel, so when it is trying to exit. And so you can find that you do not have a very neat line here, like uh, the, I don't know if you, I don't know if you, uh, I have like a plot uh, here prepared, no, huh? I think not, no, I, I do not. Uh, so what you would see would be that your ligand can uh, go outside of your funnel, so like doing something like this, jumping on the, uh, on the boundary of the funnel because the funnel has not enough strength to push it back right, right at, the, at the beginning where the funnel begins, but you, you're just losing timing convergence. It's, it's not a, an error. It's just that you're losing, you're sampling also this space, these uh, boundary uh, states that you are not interested in. So, so we should, it's it, that it, is proportionality is direct, so we should increase it for bigger ligands, or? I or? think that you could use, uh, uh, so uh, with uh, 35,100, it was like uh, a solid wall. So the ligand was like touching and then going back uh, immediately after. So it was not able to uh, sample a little bit the boundaries of the, of the funnel. So uh, you could use like uh, also this value for uh, bigger ligands. Uh, if you see though that your ligand is like uh, sampling too much outside of the funnel, just increase the, uh, the kappa and it will just be pushed back imme immediately after. Okay. This is one of the things that we do when we optimize uh, the simulation. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, we had the ligand with like uh, three heterocycles all connected together. And I think that we had to provide 50,000 for that one. Okay. But you will see in the simulation, of course, don't launch your production run. So I'm sure that these settings will work 
with just uh, one parameter, one random parameter, because you, you might find different errors or, di or not optimized, let's say. So see a little bit, for example, let the simulation start in the unbound and see how it behaves, how the ligand behaves. If it is enough, then you can do, go to the, with the production run. So the, the downside of having a very large value of the kappa is the bouncing ligand in the, in the cylinder part, yes? If you have a very large kappa and uh, you are providing like those two angstroms in the cylinder, you might have that effect of bouncing of the ligand because you have like a strong yes. force pushing, then it is touching the other, the other part mm -hmm. and then a, a contrary force will be pushed and the ligand will start doing this. And this might be a problem because the sampling in the space, even if you are not feeding the, the protein, the sampling in the space of the unbound will be uh, changed by this behavior. Uh, and so yes. your WRF changes and your uh, delta G changes. So yes, uh, it has to be optimized, yes. but I don't have a formula that provides you <laughs> which is the best parameter. Thanks. Then here uh, we have N being S is just how many points do I want on line pos? So in this case, it's 500. And how many points I want on line dist, which is Z, is 500. You can change these parameters. For example, if you are providing a very long path for the binding and binding, you might want for these to be, uh, for N beans to be 1,000, 1,500, OK? But the more you increase this, the more time it will be uh, required to load the, the bias. So not so much, but uh, just be, be aware of that. Uh, then I have uh, these two. Uh, I would uh, skip these two because they, they are automatically put to one and they are used for an hidden uh, functionality of the funnel. Uh, it transformed the conical shape into a sphere, but uh, uh, it's not the point of the of this uh, of the masterclass, so just skip them. And they are you you must not define them; they are already defined. And then I have here uh, label equal funnel. This uh, is a secondary way of uh, instead of defining like label colon and then the uh, the line of plumed. So I can do funnel colon and then all of these or I put all of these and then I put the flag label equal funnel. Okay. So this is just the, the system knows that this code here has be, uh, will be invoked when I call funnel or the output of this code will be invoked. And this is just uh, I want for the output to be called uh, bias which is exactly the file that we saw in uh, the folder that I had with the simulation. I had a file called bias. This is exactly why um, if you called here like test, uh, you will have a file called test. It's just the name of the file of the potential for the, for the funnel. Uh, would you like to, for me to explain also the method line? I think maybe we could continue because technically the meta D stuff is something that we should have seen from previous courses. Uh, as, as you wish. Uh, the only other thing that is related to the funnel were these uh, uh, lower and upper walls. Uh, these are the one, sorry, this one and this one, uh, which are set exactly uh, with the value that uh, were in the, uh, in the interface, uh, which were uh, low wall and up wall. And you have just to define the kappa here. Now here I exaggerated uh, way too much, uh, 500,000. But in this case, uh, just uh, when uh, it will reach the point, the, the ligand will be kicked immediately back. Uh, just be sure that the, low, the upper wall here is not too close uh, to the uh, interval where uh, you sample the unbound. 
because otherwise it will uh, be it will feel the kick of the of the upper wall. But you, you could see in my case uh, of the interface here, not this one. Give me one fast. Okay, give me this. Okay, you can see that I have the wall here and I was sampling here. Okay, so just don't select, the, don't put your wall too close uh, to, the, to the point where you calculate WRF. Uh, a lot of uh, hands raised, yes. Um, well, I, I, I will do the question. Uh, my, my only question here is like, I see that we are developing, we are using this sort of ersatz, uh, yeah, ersatz collective variables based on the funnel, right? How do yes. you break the symmetry on those collective variables? Because for example, if you have something from one side of the funnel, it technically should, will be very different to the something that you have on the other side of the funnel and it's going to be projected into the same area in the collective correct. subspace. You are absolutely correct. That is why uh, you have always to uh, be careful when using fps.lp and fps.ld in uh, your metadynamics calculation because uh, they flatten the state. So if, for example, you have a minimum here, uh, I need the structure though. For this, I need the structure. Uh, let's say that I am in this state, okay? No, uh, somewhere. Okay, you're saying like, uh, I have, let, let's say that this is my axis, okay? And I have one state here and the same state on the other opposite side, which will be same value of fps.lp and same values also for fps.ld because it comes from exactly from this problem here. If you rotate on this axis, the bias, you obtain exactly the, the, the funnel. Uh, this is uh, this is the the problem of uh, using FPS uh, as uh, as collective variable for method. But for in this case for this uh, system it was good enough. In other cases might uh, hide some uh, some uh, like your minima in the free energy calculation, and in that case you have to use uh, different collective variables for method. Okay, so you just use FPS to track the changes of the ligand, but then you construct your free energy surface on a different collective variable. So you are telling me that we shouldn't use then the FPS collective variables in those cases, right? In those cases, if the if your system has a problem that in uh, uh, for the same combination of FPS dot LP and LD. There are two different states that have to be discretized. Mm -hmm. So they would uh, be like, uh, uh, if I take a fast, take me a fast. Okay, let's yeah. say that here inside this minimum, I have two states yep. and I have to discretize them. Of course, it's better not to use uh, fps.lp in that case. Okay. In this case, though, uh, it was not a problem. Okay. Um... Yep, thank you. I, I see uh, Vittorio activating the, the cam. Uh, yes, just to tell you that we, are, we need to, to go fast to the end because uh, it's, we okay. are really out of time. So uh, just concluding this part on the fundamental dynamics, we just opened a very quick discussion on the method. If there are people that have general questions about that, and then we can move fast to show the, okay. the yes. some kinetics input uh, as a final conclusion of this masterclass. Yeah. Uh, I, will, I will try to, to go faster. So uh, let me just go one. So uh, for the next implementation of the, uh, if you have any question about the Bloom input, just write uh, uh, PMs to me and I will try to answer uh, as best as possible. I prepared for you uh, a cut of the trajectory that I uh, did in uh, in the past, so open. Okay, I want just the first. So let me see. Okay, I have the system. 
uh, let me just load the frames. Okay. Okay, just a moment to load the frame. Okay, here we have, uh, you cannot see the interface because it's uh, flickering, uh, 2,840 frames. Now, uh, we'll just show you a representation that is better, it's more suitable for uh, to understand protein uh, with new cartoon and resne mol with the uh, liquorice. Okay, so this is just the simulation. Now, if you, uh, if you take your, in, the interface, the second interface should be here somewhere. Here, okay. And you load, let's say that I, I leave just this, uh, this not, is not the last uh, free energy surface, but let's just go, uh, as fast as possible. Uh, what you can do with this uh, is uh, if you um, loaded your trajectory is we already had the binary plume the input uh, set. You can uh, calculate a driver of this uh, uh, trajectory, printing the states of each of the collective variable of interest for each frame of the trajectory. So each of these 2000 frames and create a Colvar file that will be uh, compared with the free energy surface. So when you click on trace, uh, this button here, it will give you a line here, a red line, signing uh, where you are here in the visualization state where uh, is in the free energy surface. So uh, let me just see if I, because I already did that uh, before. So let me see if the file is ready should be all bar. Yes, it's ready. So uh, you just have to do the driver. To do the driver, you have to provide an input file. Uh, in my case, uh, it was uh, driver.dat, uh, trajectory. It doesn't take automatically the one that is visualized. You have to uh, provide it. So it was cat.trr, the extension of the file. Uh, a PDB file to define masses and, uh, and charges, but in this case, just masses are necessary. And you click on run driver, but these are already done. If you click on trace, you can see the red line here. I don't know if you can see it is exactly at the minimum. And in fact, I am in the bound state. But if I go outside, let's say this state here, which is outside, and I click on trace, I'm way over here. Okay, so if you, in the simulation, you want to visually inspect the simulation and see, okay, I see like an intermediate state here. What is this state? Okay, you press, uh, you create the cover, press and trace, I'm here. Okay, so you can check if there is a minimum here. And the last thing that I wanted to show you is that with the cover or with the same cover uh, selected, you can, for example, I'm interested in this second minimum here. I can right click and create a selection in the canvas. And this will uh, uh, show like a, a warning. I'm going to write 65 frames because it will take all the frames in the simulation that is visualized that belongs to this interval in the free energy surface. So I click proceed, yes. I click on yes. Here I have all the uh, files that have been written. And if I go here, I am in the uh, folder that I uh, selected at the beginning of exercise three. I will have, I should have a folder that is a selected structure. So you can see here. And uh, I should have like a log, extraction.log. These are the frame that have been selected. Okay. And inside the folder, These are the PDBs that have been uh, selected and that belong to this section 
of the free initial phase. If I provide a different selection, then uh, another set will be will be created. But I suggest you to just uh, take the folder that have been created and move it uh, before uh, doing this. Yes. Uh, this should be exactly, I mean, again, the same frame that, for example, if you plotted free energy of 800 nanosecond, uh, I mean, 800, which is 250 nanosecond, it should be the exactly trajectory of those 250 nanosecond, yes? Uh, the trajectory file that you loaded. Uh, yes. Our, our file should be exactly, so this free energy that you're uh, showing the, for example, minimum location is the very last one, I believe, I mean. No, uh, I just uh, I just selected one randomly. It's not the very last. Uh, okay, the... but uh, but if if uh, my question is that should it uh, match? For example, if you have only six hundred nanosecond simulation, it will automatically don't consider the rest of them. Yes, in the transit. For this analysis, uh, you mm -hmm. of course need to take the latest free energy surface, mm -hmm. because that would be the uh, closest to the reality. Uh, value in the free energy surface. So, for example, I have like a minimum here, but let's say that uh, after one microsecond, these two minima invert. Okay, so this becomes <laughs> the absolute minimum, and this is the the second minimum. Okay, in that case, uh, if uh, I, I'm interested in this, uh, I, I need to have the last free energy surface to understand what is happening. Yeah, but and the whole trajectory should be there. Yes, the whole tra the trajectory file should contains all the simulation trajectories or not. That's my question. Uh, you can load all the trajectory. Uh, that you will be a huge file, you know. That's... Yes, you will see that uh, the VMD will crash after reaching yes. the the, uh, the, uh, the 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 limiting memory that for, yes. for VMD. So what I do generally, uh, mm -hmm. since I uh, like to run in multiple workers. Uh, I load one walker at a time. You can do that. In this case, you are like fragmenting your simulation or you just stride your simulation. Okay, so in, it's, in not general, they... that... Sorry? it's not necessary that to have the whole simulation loaded as a, okay. It, and it will find it. It will find it. If, if there is any config, if any, there is any snapshot related to that minimum, it will find it. Yes, and that okay. is why you generate the callbar file relatively to the simulation that you loaded. Because if you have a strided simulation, oh, then you create the callbar file that is proper <laughs> to that simulation. So for example, if you stride again of the 10 times uh, strided, you create a new callbar file, which is 10 times strided, and you can still work. Of course- Guys, will... Guys it's, it's, a, it's a matter to become expert a little bit of, uh, not only of our tool, but also plume to whatever, because you can do whatever you want. Of course, you can uh, use the latest trajectory. You can stride your latest trajectory in order to load with the VMD, then compute an, a, a different callbar, a different CV, so a different quality variables to use in driver and upload the states. And you can extrapolate, you can extract the states of your interest with the descriptor of your interest using one worker, two workers, whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Of course, as Stefano said, closer you are to the convergence to the last state, uh, I would say. Uh, if you consider the very last state, the, the very last run of your simulations, you are you can appreciate it better if you are closer to the convergence or not. But you can do whatever you want. It's very flexible in that sense. Yeah, that, that's very nice, you know, feature to have. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I guess with with this, uh, I ended the third exercise. So you add in the end. Uh, an estimate of the absolute binary free energy, check for convergence, analysis, the visual inspection of the structure with respect to the free energy surface. And you can also extract uh, the states that are of interest. And if you want, clusterize them afterwards to, uh, for further analysis, let's say. Uh, so this and the access, the or everything that you could do, let's say, in yeah. exercise three. So we are just... running very out of the time, guys. Uh, I, uh, we can continue a little bit uh, just to show you the last exercise. And I really would like to ask all your questions. So if we have very quick questions, please, we can, we try to, we do our best to, to, uh, to answer to all your questions, but I think it's almost That's... two hours, so we have to close. 
Mm. Just very, very uh, final question. Uh, so the call bar that you loaded for uh, for finding the trajectory. So here is the D1 uh, as a collective variable in the free energy space. So the only call uh, bar that required in the uh, in the driver file should be that D1 is sufficient to find that trajectory corresponding to uh, that I mean minimum or any other place. Am I right? Uh, in this case, yes. Uh, let's say that you have to use the same collective variable that you use for the free energy surface. So if for yes. in this case, I'm plotting the free energy surface with respect to D1, the call bar and the driver should be should have in the line for the request D1. Yeah, only D1 is sufficient because FSLP required the center of mass and charges for, for calculating that, that make problems. So D1 will work. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, but please keep in mind that D1 is just a distance. You, it could be also a, collect, uh, a coordination collective variables. Depends, depends which, is the be which is the best collective variable that describes the binding of, of the ligand to your molecular target. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. In binding simulation, generally, uh, the geometrical descriptor, like a distance, it's pretty good. Uh, they, it's uh, reliable and uh, I would say useful also because uh, by visual inspection is very straightforward. Uh, good CV to analyze and to understand where you are in the systems. And then you can proceed with more detail and more accurate analysis if it required with some waiting uh, later on. But at least as a very first analysis of the results, it's, it's very useful. So guys, before proceeding with the very last example with the kinetic uh, sample input, is there any question generally on the topic, on the fundamental dynamics or something that you want to ask before? Because then we conclude the session with, uh, with the, some kinetic inputs. So we don't go back to this argument anymore. It seems not, no hand raised. So Stefano, please go ahead so we can go to the end. So the last exercise was more like uh, an added exercise. Uh, it, it is uh, like an added module to, if you want to calculate ki kinetics, because uh, as of now, we just spoke about uh, um, thermodynamics. And in this case, uh, I did the exercise together with you. And my, wait to that my terminal froze, okay. I did the exercise with you. So I already uh, gave uh, you the uh, input that uh, was used for my uh, infrequent metadynamics, uh, which is uh, this one that you can find in the, uh, on, uh, on the web page of the masterclass. So the main difference from a standard, you can see that here, uh, I do not have the uh, funnel anymore because uh, since I found the bound state, well, I was starting from the bound state. Well, let's say that you finished your fundamental dynamics, so you didn't know which was the, the bound state. Uh, now you have it. So you extract with the interface, for example, the state, and then you begin an infrequent simulation starting from that state. And what you want to do is to go from one state to one other. In the problem that I gave you, for the exercise that I gave you in the, in the website, you were changing from uh, a state which is called state A, that was the minimum, uh, the um, crystallographic structure of the benzamine tryptin system to a state P, which was like uh, uh, an intermediate state before going to the, to the unbound. And you can see uh, here clearly that there's like a jump in the distributions. This jump in the distribution and not something that is linear like, like this is given by the fact that we are using infrequent metadynamics. So the main difference of infrequent metadynamics with the normal metadynamics is the eight. You can see here that is 0 0.62. And uh, generally, for example, we use two or 1.5 in, uh, uh, in uh, funnel metadynamics and the pace, which is 4,000 instead of 500. Okay, so the potential is less, each Gaussian that I place is less and very strided. That allows me to sample, you can see a state, and then when I have enough energy, I have jumps. You can see like this, then I return back, so on and so forth. 
For the exercise, I requested for you to do the jump from A to P because it requested less time. But for this exercise, I wanted to show you uh, something more like uh, maybe interesting, uh, which was uh, going to the directly to the unbound state. And I considered my unbound state at 1.5. So for the settings that I used at 1.5, benzamidine was just leaving uh, the protein. It is still feeding the protein, but it was out, it was out of the binding pocket, okay? So for example, for this simulation, I have a 1.5, let's say, here, around here, I have the complete uh, um, unbinding process. So what you had to do for this exercise was to run several times this kind of simulation with this input. And in my case, I run, uh, uh, well, I was running 90 uh, simulations, but only uh, 68 uh, ended correctly and only a few could uh, uh, reach the unbound state. Uh, so the simulation are this one. I was trying to access, uh, this is the always the uh, CSCS cluster. You can see all here, all the folders. And I'm going to take an example. For example, simulation five was able to go to the unbound. Uh, I think that I have though the value here. Let me just because then I can plot them and show you. So uh, documents, analysis, master class, okay. Okay, so if I plot, for example, the yields of five, we said, using one and two, I obtain this graph here. Uh, let me uh, switch to lines. I said lines. Okay, so I have this plot, this plot here. So in this case, what after launching each simulation, you let them run, and you observe when the uh, simulation goes out after one point five, which in this case is around this time. You sign this time. We, and you, then you gather together all the times from all the different simulations that were able to reach the unbound. Now, that time is the unbound time for your infrequent metadynamics. So uh, you still are receiving the, uh, the kicks from the, from the bias potential. In order to rescale the time that you uh, extracted from, for example, the yields file, uh, with the presence of the funnel, you had to calculate this here, the alpha, which is the acceleration factor. And the alpha here is a weighted average of the potential that you placed in a given state S for given time T. In my case, I created a, a small, I uh, should have it here. I created, uh, where are you? Okay, I created a, a bash script, uh, which is, no, okay, yes, show me. Okay, this one. So this is in Hawk. You, you can use whatever program you want, uh, not very user-friendly for uh, one that would, start begin begin to see this uh, this kind of stuff but uh let's say that it is just an oak script that takes uh, everything that is uh, in uh, the culver file or better say in the column of the bias of the uh, culver file because the uh, let me show you a culver file the example of a culver file so this is a culver file for uh, simulation 5 so you see that the last two columns are method.bias and method.work. So I know that at this time, six, at this value of distance, 0 0.401659, I had placed at zero bias, okay? So what this script does, it reads the time 
because I have to do a weighted average with respect to time. And then it reads uh, which potential was applied at that time for that position. And then computes all of them. So all of these until I reach the time here that was uh, selected by when I stopped. So when let's say here I'm almost at six, uh, no, more than 60. So I, I provide to the script, let's say 62. So my script will take all the lines until I reach 62,000 here, because this is in uh, uh, plumed works in uh, um, picoseconds. So until you reach 62,000 here, somewhere here, and it will wait and do the average of this value here, the exponent of this value. And for example, for simulation five, the alpha was 2034. So the final value is 2034. So what you do, uh, you take the time that you extracted here and you multiply it by alpha. And that is the time that should take your simulation to unbound in a normal simulation. So a standard molecular dynamics. Instead of waiting for a standard molecular dynamics to unbound, you do this and you should obtain a good enough uh, um, estimate for uh, a standard molecular dynamics. In the case of uh, simulation five, it was 125,000. Um, nanoseconds, which is 125 mi microseconds. And I just uh, created, uh, now you can see it here. I don't know if I can zoom, oh, I changed something. Okay, uh, I don't know if you can uh, see it here. I created just a, a list of uh, times that are all the simulation that were able to reach the, the unbound. And then you, you try to fit uh, the scatter points that are these points here with respect to time with the function here, which is a, cumul a cumulative distribution function, one minus the exponent of minus t divided by tau. The parameter that is unknown here is tau, which is the... Uh, particular time for your system to uh, go to the unbound state. So you want to obtain this tau and the one divided by tau would be the estimate of your uh, k-off. Or you can calculate it on uh, the way that I, um, that I wrote in the, the last lines of the, of the web page. However, I will just uh, show you um, this is just a code in MATLAB that is available online, comes from uh, work of uh, uh, Professor Savalaglio. So uh, I can also, after this lesson, uh, give you the, the link to the paper that, uh, uh, of this code. But what it does is just uh, fitting the points that you provide with the, this function here and provide a p-value to tell you if the distribution is good enough or not. So I will just uh, run it very fast. So this run. Okay, it is telling me success, but fitting stopped because change in residuals less than tolerance. This is a plot of the attempted fitting. So you say the this line here are all my points in time. They are, since they are, um, I think that they are 14 points, it's not really enough to calculate uh, a good enough uh, value for the tau, but uh, you, you can see that the fitting line is uh, almost, uh, almost on point. And from the outputs that are here, you can see that uh, I have a p-value of 77 in this case, which is greater than the uh, what is taken for, um, uh, not benchmark, as a threshold, which is 0 0.005. And the tau calculated here is 97. And this is in uh, uh, microseconds. 
So if you do all the calculation, you will obtain a K of, so if you do one divided by this, you will obtain a K of, of 7,766, uh, second to, to the minus one, uh, which can compare to the known K of for the benzene, for the benzene tipsin system of uh, 600 uh, second to the minus one. So we are, for this calculation that I did, one order of magnitude uh, of difference between the experimental value and what I, I did. But remember that I only used 14 um, simulation in this case, um, and not uh, 50 or more than uh, is what should be provided. Yes? Oh, okay, there is a question from Palomino, yes. guys, but just want to tell you before uh, giving the microphone to Palomino, that uh, the idea of this extra exercise is just to let you know that the, the potentiality that starting from fundamental dynamics, you can also extrapolate starting states to do candy calculation that certainly will require more time and a dedicated tutorial session because there are a lot of theory behind other tool possibility to, to create a kinetic flux map of different states, wherever identification transition states, you can do many things. Just to tell you there's an extension, you starting from the final binding free energy calculation, you just compute K off, so the residence time of your drug. And if you want to characterize further, it's possible to start from these simulations to perform additional calculation with infrequent and compute the rates between different states you have identified in preliminary final metamics calculation. Just to, we, we wanted to include a try this exercise just to give you the idea at glance that which is the potentiality, the extension. Also, if you want to go towards the kinetic calculation, it's extremely important in pharmacology of drug in a in the molecular in its molecular target. So please Palomino. Um hi. So no, yours my last question was like, so I see that you span a lot of seed uh, initial simulations, right? And I am not sure because we didn't have actually time to talk about it. If you use a certain collective variable to drive the molecule from the basin state to the other intermediate ones, or you just took the ones that actually were valuable and then you do you did the Poisson fitting to those? No, uh, I used uh, the, um, in this case, I used always uh, the, the, the same distance that was defined uh, uh, as the one that I used for the final metadynamics. So I- it, I, it only depends, it, I, I would say, it only depends on the system. In this case, since the cell solvent exposed by any side, the distance is enough. In addition, the Kolmogorov's Mirnor test, which is the fitting with the Postonia distribution between the theoretical and experimental distribution function that, that, uh, that Stefan showed you, is also a check if your collective variable that you chose is uh, uh, quite good in describing the lowest degrees of motion because uh, there's the lowest degrees of freedom of your system. Because if the null hypothesis is not respect, which means that you have a very low p value going toward 0 0.05, so it's very low, this means that the fitting between the empirical, this black line, and the red one, the theoretical one, is not that good, which means that you have some hidden degrees of freedom because you have discrepancy, another Poissonian distribution of the uh, times that you collect in during your multiple independent infrequent metadynamic calculations. Think that infrequent is supposed to be infrequent because you don't want to put any bias on the transition state. This means that you, you have to keep, you have to leave that the transition between one energy minimum and the other one is, is Markovian, which means that you can uh, collect the times and you can uh, be sure that the uh, distribution is Poissonian of your data. And again, uh, the statistical test that you can do with the p-value is an additional evidence that the choice of the CV was good. Okay, yeah, thank you. No, my, my point only was that, because I think as Stefano mentioned something, I mean, I, uh, that he chose the ones that actually connected the two, trans the two minima in the free energy surface, right? So that- Well, in this case, it ju it we just simply run uh, unbinding free energy from the lowest energy, which is the binding mode of the ligand into the uh, molecular target. If you become expert, proficient with your techniques, uh, and you identify for your system, so there are two major factors. One, should, you should become very expert of your system in terms of structure, binding cell, whatever, so from a structural point of view, and the other become very expert of the technique, fundamental dynamics. 
Once you combine these two, of course, you can proceed with the more accurate evaluations. So just discretize, identify multiple states, and you can compute the crossing between different states until they reaching their bound state. In this specific tutorial case, we just simply run one simulations multiple times from the lowest bi energy binding mode until the bound state. Okay, great, thank you. My pleasure. Other questions? It seems not. I think that everybody's tired. So Stefano, please, we want to conclude. Okay, uh, well, uh, in practice, this concludes the, the fourth exercise. We have uh, uh, an estimate of the tau, which should be the uh, residence time or the inverse, uh, the, the, the unbinding time for uh, the uh, benzamine in trypsin system. So on, also, no, it's, this is actually is the kinetic chaos, in other words. It's mm -hmm. the inverse okay. of the kinetic mm -hmm. uh, chaos, yes. And uh, the way that I wrote uh, to, in the website is an additional way to compute the, the k off. So you just um, sum the, all the times that you saw this transition. So for example, in my case, it was 14, divided by the number of the times scaled by alpha for all the simulations. So you should obtain a value that is uh, almost the same with this kind of calculation. And okay. Yes, that is that is uh, that is all. Guys, I hope that you enjoy this masterclass. I understand that many concepts are probably uh, difficult for some of you, but still, please, we wrote a very clear protocol paper, initial protocols. Read carefully that, and you are free to contact us to send an email, whatever, in order to have additional information on the fundamental calculation, kinetic calculation as well. And uh, uh, likely in the future, we will have another class on the fundamental dynamics or kinetic calculations in the future. So just have fun and enjoy with Plumet and with fundamental dynamics. Thank you. Okay. If there is no other question, uh, so I thank you, Stefano, I thank all of you and uh, Giovanni and Max for the invitation for this very beautiful masterclass. And I hope you enjoy the, the other classes that you will take in next month. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of the master classes. Bye bye. Stefano, we just have to, to end the session. We don't have to do anything uh, because. Yeah. No, no, uh, yes, but we have to end the, re the registration now. Ah, you have to oh. do that? Yes. So you do this, you do all? Yes, yes, uh, I will do that. Okay, everybody.